All right, good morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about a um, progressive <coughs> manure application management system that we've developed to help uh, improve our water quality. For those of you who were on the Digester tour yesterday, you were able to come up to Whatcom County and see firsthand kind of the um, environment, uh, climate, et cetera, that uh, we kind of developed this for and what we operate in. So if you go about, and for those of you who weren't about, uh, 100 miles north of here is Whatcom County. We're right on the border uh, with Canada, which is here. Uh, in this little zone, we have an extremely productive agricultural area. We also have a lot of resources, such as surface water, which as you can see by all these little blue lines, um, indicate all of our surface water. This larger kind of blue area is an aquifer. Uh, it's pretty shallow. It comes up to the surface in many areas. And all of the red dots represent all of the dairy operations. In Whatcom County, we have about a quarter of Washington's dairies. So we have a lot of ag in a small area. We also have a very productive and growing raspberry blueberry production uh, in that zone. So our resources um, are challenged in a lot of ways for our surface water quality in particular here in uh, kind of our areas where a lot of this water kind of comes up. It empties into Bellingham and Portage Bay and other areas. And these are very productive shellfish growing zones, which are very concerned primarily for the human health aspects and fecal coliform in particular. So that's kind of driven backwards from here up into, hey, so things need to be done. Let's focus on reduction of any type of contamination into our surface waters that could make it down into these other aquaculture and farming areas. So with that in mind, um, in particular with all the dairies in our county, we got a grant to look at, let's develop some type of a risk application management system for dairy operators and manure users in particular on a temporal or timing and spatial or location area for year-round manure application. In Whatcom County as well, and for those who aren't aware, the Washington State is one of the few states that actually has a Dairy Nutrient Management Act that requires facil dairy facilities only to have a nutrient management plan. Whatcom County added on to that in 1998, and we have a manure spreading ordinance that said you cannot spread manure within a certain time frame on bare ground or in other conditions. That's from about October 31st to mid-February. Unfortunately, that doesn't always correlate with when we want them to apply manure or not to apply manure. And so this project looked at that as well. When is the best time to apply on soil types, etc.? So we um, kind of took this four R's of nutrient management, if you will. The right timing, placement, source, and rate. The only R there is right. I still don't understand why it's four R's, but whatever. Um, another topic. And so in particular, we said, when do we have the biggest issues? And it's timing and placement in particular. And as you can tell here, we get a lot of precipitation through the year. We get the majority of that, October, September, October, November, we get a big chunk after our last applications on forage in October. And then we get a lot of that rain, February, March, April again, when folks want to get back on to get manure on their fields so that it's ready for grass growth or for corn planting, et cetera. Those are two major dairy crops. So we said, let's really focus on these two things and let's see what we can do with timing and placement and creating a tool to help farmers really figure those two things out. The right rate and source is a little bit easier for them to figure out the agronomic application, figuring out do I need liquids or solids, which lagoon do I pick out of, a little bit easier. So we, we chose those two things um, on our project that we kind of deemed ARM or application risk management. And that basically that process, as I mentioned, it's for that producer, number one, what is agronomic rate for that time of year? So that's up to them to decide. And then it's the next three that really is our ARM system. It's identifying those low risk or optimal fields for different times of the year, determining what conditions uh, they should be applying. We've created a manure spreading advisory and utilizing seasonal manure risk um, setbacks, and I'll show you those and then filling out this worksheet. That's kind of the heart or the meat of this whole system that I'm really going to go over today and show you some things. And then, of course, applying and monitoring to the fields, doing this assessment year-round. So if you want to apply manure, you need to go through this process every time. So just to highlight a couple things, um, not to go into them too long. I could spend 20 minutes probably on every slide I presented, so I'm going to breeze over a few of them. 
So for the runoff risk rating, we go in and we work with farmers on identifying their high risk fields, which would be red, to their low risk fields, which are blue, based on 15 different soil characteristics or visual appraisal, and then chatting with that farmer about, you know, what are these fields here and there? Because sometimes you have got elevation differences you can't tell by mapping alone. So we go through and we identify for runoff as well as for leaching, which are usually kind of inverse. Uh, when is the high time for runoff leaching or for runoff risk and for leaching risk? And we provide the maps for that. So it helps them kind of identify, all right, I want to get out in February. What field should I be looking at? Or midsummer, you're probably safe on everything. Come October, which field should I be avoiding? So it's a nice way for them to evaluate that. The next step would be to access our manure spreading advisory. And this is what we've created. It's for the entire Puget Sound, actually, and it actually spreads down into Oregon. We created one of these for them as well. This is where a farmer can just log into this in the morning. And by color, if it's red, it's, if I always tell them, it's, if it's red, go back to bed. Or if the risk is high, don't apply. Try to find something that rhymes for them, right? So uh, what they can do is go on there, click on their, you know, zoom in, click where they are, and it gives them a three-day forecast. So you get, what's my risk today? What's my risk tomorrow and three days out? Past that, we don't really trust our forecast to be accurate enough to give a good indicator. Usually they're not planning too far out. So this is a great way for them to understand, okay, it's, it's low today, but my risk is increasing. I should probably get out there, or sometimes vice versa. Today it's a high risk, it looks like it's low, I can call the custom applicator and get him scheduled. So it's a nice way that they can utilize that. It's also a way that if it's high, it tells them that you're probably having an issue today. You're going to have um, kind of against, if you want to go against that fine, but if you're going to apply, you're likely going to have a risk. But nonetheless, uh, we also have a next step, which I'll show you in a minute. But this, the nice part about this map and how we created it is it's auto-updated from NOAA with their precipitation data. So it's already loading up. I don't have to do this by hand every day. It's, it does its own thing. And as you zoom in, we're in the process of adding in a leaching risk rating that should be kind of popping up here soon. So not only do they get that runoff risk, they zoom in and they get that leaching by soil layer. So it's pretty nice. So on this map, not only do they get the risk, but they get a little bit of a feedback. So I can kind of give a little narrative for my region or whatever region it's at, and just letting them know hi today and what's coming up and some different forecasts or look out this time of year for this, that, and the other. And then there's also, um, here is our current manure application setback distance. So instead of having like 100 feet year round or something of that nature, we've got a dynamic distance that goes from 10 feet to 40 feet to 80 feet throughout the year, depending on when is that risk higher or lower. So it allows them, they're okay giving 80 feet during high risk times if we let them have 10 feet in the summer during low risk times, they're okay with that kind of manure setback rather than saying stay away, <coughs> sacrifice that area. So it's worked so far. And we actually have a project coming up where we're actually going to field test that to make sure that that's valid. One neat thing we're able to do with this is track when people use it with Google Analytics. The neat part is when you overlay uh, the precipitation on top of that, which would be the orange, you can see that folks are using it uh, at appropriate times when you've got little events coming and going and when you've got big events no one's using it meaning no one is they know the big events coming and they're just oh, I'll do something else today so it's nice to be able to see that folks are actually using this at appropriate times and we actually get about a hundred page views a month um, in our zone which is great so throughout Puget Sound we get a lot more than that so people are kind of picking up and using this which is also um, a great thing to be able to see one neat thing about the spreading advisory, what's really important is we've got January here, um, February, March, and April. And the red is areas when they couldn't apply, the green is when they could. And what this shows is that we've got chunks of weather, and then this kind of pops up every January, where we've got these low risk times. Sometimes you only have a day or two, meaning if this is a forage crop, you need a few days for it to dry out before you can get back out there. So this is a way that we can really see how is how effective is this in giving folks enough time to apply, chatting with farmers, was this useful for you? So we're able to backtrack and see um, how this is working out for folks. And so far so good, and we are able to identify here's a good time for manure application, and they can move forward with that. 
So it is actually, it works pretty well. And we validated this against forecasted versus actual precipitation. And lo and behold, the forecast is right 50% of the time. <laughs> you can flip a coin. But when you give them a little bit of a 10 to 15% margin of error, it's actually about 70%. So we feel very confident that this is going to give folks a good idea. It's not going to be telling them it's high when it's low, et cetera. We don't have a lot of that. It's awfully close which is important because if you know farmers, if it goes against a few times where it says it's high and then it ends up being a beautiful day, they're gonna stop using it pretty darn quickly. So we wanna make sure that this is giving them a, a good, accurate prediction um, all the time. So it's working very well. The heart of this, as I mentioned, once they say, okay, Manure uh, Spreading Advisory says I'm good to go, then they fill out an arm worksheet. And this is a web-based worksheet that we've created that as they go through, we're having them enter specific things, and I'll show you what those categories are here in a moment. Um, but they're basically forecast field conditions and protect, protective measures. And as they go through, it gives them feedback. Where are they high risk or low risk on all these different parameters, giving them cautions or different advisories that we want them to have throughout the year. And at the end, it tells them on a specific field, on a specific day, is that field high or low risk or something in between. So if your forecast says it's high risk, but you know you've got a field you can get out on, this might be a way to supplant that and vice versa. The forecast may say it's low risk, but by the time you go through this, your field is saturated or something else is happening and it's high risk. So it's a way for them to get rid of applying by dates and more apply by when it's appropriate for a field and for agronomic needs. Gives record keeping, but it also, and the flexibility there, but also some <coughs> accountability. If all things say high risk, they go anyway and have an issue, they knew it. So it's nice to give them some type of a knowledge, educational, and record keeping piece together. And within this worksheet, we've got a lot of parameters here precipitation, soil type, soil moisture, et cetera. And what we found, these are the ones that matter. So we looked at all of the different factors that can affect runoff or leaching. And these are the ones that we knew they could get easily. They're gonna know these things about their field. Most likely they can find this information easily. Our, if they go from the manure spreading advisory into this, it auto fills some of this data for them. So we've got this uh, really important kind of information that's in there. And the most important part of this is now we need to field test this and verify it. Uh, additionally, we also created a website for them to understand when we're asking about any one of these, how do they figure out, I don't know what the density of my field cover is, so they can click here and be able to see pictures and get that. So that information education part is extremely <coughs> important in helping support their understanding of what they're doing. And then we did field measurements, and I want to show you um, quite a few slides about our data and what we've got here. But it was really important for us to understand the nutrient cycling, to understand risk levels, and to tune those thresholds in that worksheet. And we're still continuing our data collection, uh, but I'll share some of this with you. So we had six five-acre plots, two treatments, a conventional application, and uh, our arm system on silt, uh, sandy silt loams and the regular silt loam, so kind of a well-drained soil and a not so well-drained soil. And we took a lot of measurements, and I'm just going to show you a couple snapshots. Again, we had so much data, uh, really great stuff. Our field system looked a bit like this, where we're taking um, our soil waters as it percolates through in panelized cimeters. We also took forage and soil. We had correlated groundwater sampling with USGS. We had surface uh, water collection and those that were applicable uh, and others and weather data, precip, et cetera. We had, really had a lot of information. What we did find here, this is the part that really matters to producers, was our forage yield. When we got them to apply kind of on an offset, starting in January, ending in September to account for those sandy leach, um, high leaching soils and runoff timing, versus our silt-based soils, which are kind of offset. They can start maybe in February through October. What we found is by getting out early, we had a significant increase in uh, the productivity of that yield by density, not necessarily height, meaning that we were getting a denser stand, more nutrient uptake, greater infiltration by the water not being able to move through. So we had a lot of that. What we found in our silt-based soils was the application in the fall yielded a greater yield 
because you had such a longer before that nutrient could really convert over to plant usable, it took a bit longer and that you saw it kind of really catching up later. In the summer, we didn't really see much of a difference there. So that earlier application really had a benefit for those sandy soils. For soil phosphorus, um, in our measurements, we really just saw a lot of up and down here. We didn't see a lot of difference in there, but we definitely saw soil nitrate having big differences with our application timing in particular. So as we go through, and, and this is a few years of data, you're seeing about four years, and what I want to highlight here is we've got the, um, our samples that we took at one foot, two foot, and three foot, and you can really see during the growing season, you see a significant difference and we see that correlated with our soil temperatures that goes through and our application of that. So our starting and ending, here's a new year starting and ending. And you can really see that this fall time period, we had significant leaching. We're really watching that nitrate go through that soil and being pushed by the rain. So that timing of manure application really mattered. When they were really using all of our tools and using that arm system, they were able to really kind of offset that. And when we looked um, at this kind of time period right here, and I'm going to pull that out for you and show you correlated with precipitation, which is the blue lines here, I want to highlight our leaching events in particular. You can see here the uh, groundwater data being these little circles. The yellow ones is our conventional, the red is that um, arm or kind of our application risk management. And in groundwater in particular, we saw lower levels of nitrate being leached down when they used this new system and really applied based on their soil conditions rather just on, hey, I usually apply up to October because I can because of dates. So by really managing this appropriately, we really saw a decrease in our groundwater leaching. Um, our soils were kind of similar patterns you really see as they apply manure and it warms up and that becomes available. That was normal. We saw that happening, but we didn't see it leaching down, which was a really nice effect. In the surface water, what we discovered here, as many of you know, fecal coliform is not the best indicator. And we were doing grab samples there, but sometimes our field actually reduced it and sometimes it was higher. So our surface water so far is kind of inconclusive on being able to indicate whether we had very good runoff in that type of a grab sample that we took. So generally what we found is nitrate leaching is higher in the winter and uh, the fall when we start getting rain here, no surprise. And that was determined by application in the late fall. The later you went out, the greater you're leaching because as your forage is stopping, kind of it's up nutrient uptake, it's really decreasing in productivity. You still have manure converting because your temperatures are still great and it just rains out. So stopping early was great on sandy soils. On silty based soils, you could take that a little bit further because you didn't get as much of that leaching effect. Irrigation, sorry, irrigation water does the same thing in the summer. You over irrigate, you're pushing it through the profile. The runoff, of course, was a big factor and precipitation was the biggest thing and that's no surprise. What we found is in particular in the spring, that was a bigger issue. In the fall, we had large events, but the soil could take in a lot of that. So no surprise there, but the soil type was our biggest influence on both of these. And so it's really important for producers to understand their soil type and to plan their management according to um, application schedules with those soil types. And that manure conversion and availability had the biggest effect. Chemical fertilizer isn't quite um, like that. So final conclusions, developing these customized application strategies for, farm, for farms, optimizing them with timing, using the tools that we developed, creating these real-time management tools brings reality and real time for them, for those nutrient management plans that are typically static and a bunch of paper on a shelf, which was great. And we've had very good adoption of this to date and it's just growing. So with that, I know I'm out of time and you can find me for questions um, and I'm happy to talk about that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's give her a hand. Thank you.